Hello, hello everybody. Uh, welcome for one of the last talks uh, today. So uh, hopefully we can just take a little bit light and enjoy and just watch some of the new web APIs for 2018. Um, the target of this goal uh, will not necessarily be like uh, teaching you something useful, um, but maybe more like teaching you something new that you might not have known. So this talk is basically a sum up about like upcoming web APIs that may not be completely standardized yet or may not be completely supported in a browser yet, So, but whenever is that for a web API? So uh, my name is Tim. I'm a JavaScript engineer at a company called Elastic. Um, and these are my Twitter handle, email, whatsoever, in case you want to contact me. So we'll also make it a little bit uh, dynamic so that nobody falls asleep, uh, even due to the late hour. Yeah, you can dance later. Um, but beside this, uh, the interaction would mostly go towards like, I, I would be interested in like, uh, have you ever heard about those APIs? Have you ever used them? Um, so I will always do a quick vote uh, at, the, at the beginning of each API. And we are actually starting with something called the WebShare API. So please uh, raise your hands if you've ever heard about the WebShare API. Okay, and leave your hands up uh, if you've ever used it. Okay. That's great. That means we are learning. Everybody's learning something here. Or most of people are learning something here. So that's great. Um, WebShare API. Uh, what problem is it supposed to solve? So it's basically supposed to solve an issue. If we are currently building a web page and we want to include share mechanisms, um, we go there and basically search out all the links. Like we are searching for a Twitter link to embed their Twitter share button. We are looking for a uh, Facebook share button, Reddit share button, Google Plus share button, most likely not. Um, but anyway, we are looking for all those buttons and, uh, and place them on our web page so that users can actually then use them. Or because we often are lazy, we might uh, use a third party service that actually does this for us where we just embed it. Um, but there's an, an issue, like, like always, like there are always like, um, like sharing providers l uh, missing in there, or you would just put, if you put every possible sharing provider in there, then just an totally overload for the user, and they may only be used like, like four of them, and they are be completely down in the list and whatsoever. So on our mobile device, we actually have already a possibility for this, and um, we have the share menu that we are used from like native apps when we share something, and the web share API wants actually gives access to this menu. So um, there's code. There will be a lot of code also, um, because I want to give you all like, like an impression about how those APIs work and how they are designed, just to give you like the, the minimal code examples for all APIs uh, and show, show how they can be, uh, how you can call them and use them. And um, so for the share API, it would be something uh, that you call on the navigator object, navigator.share pass an object that has a title, a text, uh, and URL. At least either the text or the URL has to be uh, present. And it will return a promise, uh, which will resolve like whenever the user uh, selected a share method or rejected in case the user canceled uh, that menu. And that looks then as follows. If you're just calling this method, um, and you press the button, then suddenly all those, like in this case for Android, the well-known like um, share dialog pops up, which then of course only have the apps uh, in there that you actually are using on your device so that you might actually want to use. So for example, I don't have a Facebook account, I don't have Facebook, so meaning I don't need any Facebook buttons on any share page, and this API could tear, take care about exactly like this. And then I use it, and again, like the native app kicks then in, and like I can send a mail, uh, share it via Twitter, whatever the native app implements in this case. Um, so this is another slide or type of slide that uh, you will now see during this talk a lot, because um, of course the issue with like all these upcoming APIs um, is like like, but where can I use it? And um, so I've put together like always like the statistics like when does it arrive or when uh, ar did it arrive already like in Edge, in um, Chrome, uh, Firefox and Safari. 
And for something like the share API, it's currently looking like this. Um, edge nothing, which literally means they don't have it in their feature page yet listed as under consideration or anything, so it means there's no information about this at all. In Android, this has actually arrived. And in Chrome, on Android, it has arrived since version 61. And um, it was already there, but behind the flag, since version 55. And um, Firefox, in Firefox, <coughs> things are not always that clear with the issue tracking because there's no like global like progress page or whatever. So I'm trying always to dig out like the, the actual issues in the issue tracker referencing this. And for WebShare, it's uh, the public signal is there that they want to implement, and it's rather positive that, uh, that they want to implement it. And in Safari, this uh, API is currently under consideration. So um, we have seen now the WebShare API, so, but there's like the opposite way around still. So what we would still need is like, I mean, we are living in a world where there are progressive web apps everywhere and natives going to die or not, or then again, uh, depends on the year. Um, and then we are, what if our like, now we want to have Twitter Lite, for example, progressive web app, so we don't need to install like anything anymore. But if I want now to use this app or this progressive web app for sharing, I'm again having the problem, like there's currently no mechanism that I could like, use this as a native share provider. And that's actually um, what the WebShare target API is doing. So it's doing the exact opposite direction, meaning I can register my application to be used whenever the user wants to share something. And so it should show up as like a sharing provider. The API for that is rather simple, um, and not necessarily would deserve the title API. Um, you just have to put like in your uh, web app manifest, so basically the manifest like every progressive web app talk has taught you since five years, where you put the name, where you put like the icons of your web application, you just put another key called share target in there. And this has another key like URL template, um, which can have placeholders for the title, the text, and the URL that should be shared. And if, you're, uh, if the user now installed like your progressive web app, um, they will get, uh, and they click on something um, to share it. Now your web app will also be presented in the dialog that we have just seen as if it would have been a native app installed and the user selects it. And at that very moment, this URL within your application is called and you can do whatever you need to do um, to share it. Um, yeah, these slides get more depressing over time. Um, Chrome is in development, basically everything else has not yet given any signal towards this, so this is also kind of the specification that's currently solely um, driven forward by some Chrome engineers. Um, but we will see in the future. That's why it's not called Web APIs for 2017 anymore, because the year is anyway nearly done. Web Bluetooth, who have heard about Web Bluetooth? And who have implemented Web Bluetooth already? Anyone who've implemented? Yeah, great. Um, Web Bluetooth is, um, is an API to talk to Bluetooth devices, as you might think. More specific, to talk to Bluetooth LE devices, which are like a subset of the Bluetooth specifications since Bluetooth 3.0, I think. Um, and to just show the API, I want just give it like like a very quick overview about like how a Bluetooth LE device works or how how it looks internally from a software side. Um, so any Bluetooth LE device has to offer something that's called a GET, and this is basically the global service that you can connect to um, to communicate with a BLE um, device. Each device then uh, can offer something like different services. So for example. A device like a fitness armrest could offer a service called Heartbeat, and um, this service would then report like it's meant to measure your heartbeat. Each service itself has different characteristic in there. So um, a characteristic itself is now like a value that you can read out, write. This really depends on the device and the characteristic. So basically, each of the characteristic can be either read, write or notify, which notify meaning you are able to watch on it and get changes whenever, uh, whenever it occurs. So 
heart rate measurement, read um, only, and body sensor location, read only. And you can connect to those characteristics and read their values. And then just to be complete, like there can be descriptors for each characteristic, which are mainly like a human readable representation. Um, so that you can that you can use that you usually only use like for presenting reasons and not like for really working with the data reasons. Those strings are like heartbeat, heart rate measurement, body sensor location are actually like uh, well-defined strings within uh, the Pluto specifications. So I've put a link down th there. That's actually the link in the list um, where it states like these are like the common services that you can use. Um, but there's, of course, a BLE device isn't limited to uh, to those like characteristics and services that are specified, but it can also like offer like any other service that it wants, which would then like just get a UUID and you can connect to a service by a UUID and you can connect to a characteristic by a specific UUID and read out their value. And this is basically just a predefined list of, of identifiers for, for common service with common format values that you want to follow. Um, from my experience, like even though there are some stuff like heartbeat sensor, I've seen a lot of fitness armrest that doesn't use the standards but use their own, um, like their their own uh, UUID stuff. So you basically would have to figure it out for for the device individually. Um, and demo. Um, I'm having a demonstration for this, so I'm actually wearing a rather uh, cheap um, fitness armrest and it has a heartbeat sensor in there. And what we can do is like um, on, my, on my device I could connect and say, okay, I want to connect to this device, that's my device. And at that very moment, as soon as it measured my heartbeat, we should see the value and get like a live update of the value of the arm wrist directly in the browser of my mobile. That's just shown here. Um, and how does this actually look in code? Because I've promised there will be a lot of code. Can you read this also in the back? Yeah, if you thumb up there. Um, so the way this looks is you basically have the, the main entry point to the API under navigator.bluetooth. Um, if that's not there, then you don't have web Bluetooth. Um, and what you need to do is like, you need to request a specific device. Um, this method like navigator Bluetooth request device must also always like um, occur in, um, in reaction to a user interaction. So you are not allowed to like uh, pair with Bluetooth device without the user has touched the screen, clicked somewhere. And what you specify there is basically a list of uh, filters. So you basically say these, I want to filter for devices that match this criteria. And there you can specify something like name, which I used in this case, saying I want to filter for devices that have exactly this Bluetooth name. I want to, speci uh, I want to filter for uh, devices with a specific name prefix here. Or I want to specify for something like um, I require this device to have specific services because sometimes I don't care what what device I want to communicate with. Basically, I just say I want it to have like a heartbeat sensor. I'm writing a, a web application that should be able to talk to like any device that offers a heartbeat um, to read out. And so I can like specify basically like what service I require. Also, then there is like a list of optional services, which is these this services, basically every service I later want to talk to, I want to communicate with, I have to list here because otherwise I don't have permission later to talk to this service. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, like a lot of the devices don't support the standard predefined name, so doesn't this device. So this is actually the service that delivers the heartbeat in this device. and. What you did, uh, we just called request device, which pops up this dialog, let the user choose uh, for a device. And once uh, she elected a device, then what we do is like going to the uh, GATT, connect to it. When that's done, we have the server and we can get the primary service, so the larger outer box 
in this case just uh, either using again like the well-defined name or in this case the UUID of the service. Once we've got the service, we can get a specific characteristic from it. Once we've got the characteristic, we said in this case, um, because it's a notify characteristic for the heartbeat, that we want to listen for those notifications. And then we basically just register an event listener for the characteristic value changed event. And this will now trigger whenever like the, the hardware sends a new heartbeat value, which can then be found in the event.target.value. And this is most of the time then again like um, like one of the uh, like byte arrays or like you went uh, eight arrays or whatsoever that you can read out. In this case, it's luckily the standard format from the specification for heartbeat sensors. So actually in the specification, there's just like the first or second byte within this array is like the actual heartbeat. And we can use this then to display it on the page or like um, f f doing the animation timing according to this, uh, to, the, to the value. But there's way more cool stuff that you can actually do with Web Bluetooth. Um, so Alex, who also had a talk here at the conference uh, about the, the, pr uh, the, the neuronal cap and, and brainwave analysis, um, there are devices out there that support uh, Bluetooth LE, so you can use that to directly like um, reading out brain waves from the browser via web Bluetooth and analyze them in the browser. So we've written a pretty good blog post that you can visit down there just to show some like more fancy stuff than actual just reading out heartbeats. Yeah, browser support. Um, Edge has it under consideration at the moment. In Chrome, it actually landed since version 56. Firefox, it's not really clear actually because Firefox already had a Bluetooth API um, due to the fact that they uh, had uh, Firefox OS out there for mobiles, which already had Bluetooth needed kind of Bluetooth support. So what they would currently need is like fixing the Bluetooth, uh, the their Bluetooth API to match like the standard API. And the progress on this or whether or not they want to do it or not is not very clear in my opinion from the tickets. So I cannot say like what's the target range on this. And um, Safari states it's not considering, but yeah. I mean, Safari is the new Internet Explorer, so that was expected. Um, WebUSB API. Who heard about the WebUSB API? Okay, only a few hands. So uh, WebUSB API is, in contrast to Web Bluetooth, uh, that's meant to like this is a Bluetooth, L any Bluetooth LE device, talk to it from your browser. WebUSB is not actually like meant directly for developers, but more for hardware vendors. So Web Bluetooth doesn't give you the possibility to talk to any USB device attached to the computer. So Web Bluetooth, uh, Web USB always requires the USB device to be able to talk Web USB, and that only with some limitations. So what the, what could such a web USB hardware look like? So the web USB hardware is like um, having several descriptors in there. Uh, that's just the way like like the USB specification uh, works. And one of this must be the web USB descriptor that it delivers to the to the PC. Then um, this web USB descriptor have some information in there. Mainly there's like a landing page URL. Um, which we will see in a moment. There is like allowed origins. This is actually like a list of domains that are allowed to talk to this hardware. So you cannot just basically talk from any other domain than the one the hardware actually announced to the browser. And then there's a list of capabilities in there. Also, as in USB device common, then there's like the interface and several endpoints within the interface that you can use to communicate a binary protocol with this. So what happens if I now plug this USB device that has this descriptor into a, into a PC that has like a browser on it that has support for web USB? That moment you will get a notification uh, that will state like, okay, we plugged in a web USB device. If you want to use this, please use this above URL, the landing page URL. 
And once you click on the notification, it will bring you to this web page. And this web page then, as long as it's in allowed origins, can use the web USB API to talk to the device and basically send binary streams um, in both directions. So this looks uh, like the following. So I, for example, have here like a, s a small uh, Arduino board, which ha uh, has web Bluetooth enabled and just basically one LED connected. And as soon as I plug this in, I will see I will see a notification um, which states Arduino Leonardo detected. Go to this landing page URL to connect. Um, then we use this URL and we get to this absolutely overdesigned uh, color picker here. And this can again then I say connect, select the hardware device I want to connect to. And at this very moment now I can control the LED from the browser by just um, selecting a value in the color picker and it using the web USB API sending the bytes to the device and the device must interpret those in, their in, uh, in its interface. So also looking, looking in the, at the source code, um, navigator.usb is the entry point for this API. You give a request device there. Um, Pretty similar to like the web Bluetooth API, you specify a list of filters for what device are you looking. In this case, I'm just looking for a device with a vendor ID um, 2341, which are all Arduino devices. Once I have the device opened, um, uh, once I the user select the device, I open it. And um, once I have it open, I select a configuration from the device, claim a specific interface, set up a control channel, doing a lot of USB work there. And once that's done, I have a device. And then in the color picker, I basically, whenever, if there's already a device connected, I just transfer like um, over specific channel, specific bytes. So then again, it's just sending around bytes to the device. And it must know what to do with these bytes. And in this case, I'm just sending like three bytes, RGB value, and the device knows that it interprets them as RGB value and set the LED accordingly. So, um, web USB support, <laughs> we have in Edge, again, nothing. We have in Chrome from version 61 in stable. We have from in Firefox, nothing so far. And we have Safari as not considering this at the moment. Um, payment request API, who have heard about this? Ah, OK, a few more hands there. Um, so payment request API. Um, should solve one problem uh, for us. Basically, the problem: if I am developing a web shop, I now need to like manually collect credit card data, shipping data from the user, um, billing addresses, like everything all over again. So the user most likely want to use pretty much the same on Amazon that uh, she uses on like any other shopping platform. Um, so I can use this API to let the browser um, handle like this data. In case of Chrome, it usually anyway has the data from like the, from, like, the Android platform, or you can give it to it also on, on Chrome desktop. You also have this autofill option with the data. And what you're saying is like, I now need a specific like uh, payment detail, and you say, which kind of payment do you accept? And you give, say, okay, I support basic card. And then you can specify like additional parameters for this payment type. For basic card, you can say something like supported networks. I support Visa and MasterCard. And the supported types are debit, credit, and prepaid cards. Um, then you basically give a list of items that should be shown in the UI, like uh, what is the person actually buying. And you gave like a, a list of display items with at least a label and um, an amount, which is like what it costs. And then a total, which is also, again, like giving a label and an amount. As you see, these values are strings and not numbers, because the whole purpose of the payment request API is to give you, as a web page, this data that the user selects. It doesn't actually do any payment for you. So um, this is really just for letting the user give you data quick, 
That's also why it doesn't need like numbers and having rounding issues and whatsoever in there, but it's just a representation that it shows in the UI. What do you do with the data in the end is up to you. So once you've created the method data and the details, uh, you create a new payment request, pass in the method data, the details, and then show the UI. And what do you get then? Um, once the user like, uh, has selected like all the data, uh, you will get a response. And in this response, there are details, which are basically all the details that have been selected. And you can do whatever you want now to do with this data, basically issuing the payment by yourself, sending it to your payment uh, service contractor that you use for, uh, for handling your payments or whatsoever. And um, once you're done, you have to call on the response you get actually complete with either success or error. Um, because the, the payment request UI actually like stays open um, while there is like while you still may may want to send this to your payment provider so that the user has like a like a, a unique ki kind of um, UX and it doesn't like break out and you have to show another loading dialog but it's all within this one dialog. And um, how does this look like? So. If we go to something like uh, like payment request API, we can say say buy this, and this will then show this dialog in Chrome, um, which will show like again like the the um, the order summary, which with the total values that we gave and the currency we told it that it should show, and um, also um, we accepting credit card there. And you can also edit all those details and say, okay, I want to use another credit card. And this is all now uh, Chrome UI. And or you can say pay. And um, this load, this is now the phase where we are actually sending the data to our payment provider or doing whatever we want. And um, yeah, and that's pretty much that's the kind of data that you get back then from the browser. So this is really Chrome is it's very important, like Chrome doesn't do anything with the data. It doesn't handle any payment for you or whatsoever. It's just there to make it easier for your users to select uh, shipping addresses, select the card payments or payment details they have without like having them to re-enter them again. Um, and yeah, and this means like you still have to employ like kind of any payment uh, service contractor to handle this for you. Um, support for, for payment request API, therefore, is like uh, Edge. It already has landed since version 15 um, on mobile as on desktop PCs. So um, you can also use this on desktop. Same for Chrome, 61 and above. Firefox had is, has, it, has it in development. And Safari actually um, already supports it in its preview version for, for the upcoming Safari version. Um, so this one's actually pretty much available. Web NFC API. Uh, we have heard about this. Yeah. Oh, there are a few. Um, Web NFC API, also as the name suggests, I mean, these names are kind of self explanatory. It's web, insert hardware term here, API. Um, is there to like using your device to talk to NFC chips um, and do NFC communication? So. You have it in, in two ways, like with the most devices can either uh, read NFC chips or write to NFC, uh, NFC chips. And the API is catered for this. So basically you say navigator.nfc, watch, and then you will get a message. Uh, and in the message, um, there will be the different records that are read from that, uh, from that NFC tag that, uh, that has been read. You can iterate over them, and there's something like the record type in there, the media type, and the actual data in there. But the same, you can use it to like um, write to an NFC tag. You say navigate to NFC push, and you're giving it a list of records that you uh, want to push to a specific NFC tag. Um, unfortunately, no demo so far, mainly um, because of this. Um, it's nowhere yet properly released, and all the versions I got working were not working with most of the NFC tags I tried, and yeah, it was basically everything except stable. Um, 
But Edge has it already under consideration. In Chrome, it's in development. Um, Safari has nothing. And Firefox, actually, the Chrome status page states Firefox has public support for this API. I haven't found a single, like, much saying ticket in the issue tracking, so I have no idea how the Chrome team gets to this idea that it's in public support. That's why I put their question mark in the end. Um, yeah. That we are. Uh, I mean, VR is nowadays everywhere on, like, all our mobile devices can do VR over, like, Daydream and cardboard devices. PlayStation 4 has VR. Xbox One X just got VR support. And um, we are already having uh, a lot of companies out there who are showing and you could test VR. So, as usual, we need something for the web here. So, web VR. Um, yeah, it also does pretty much what you would expect. It is an API that allows you to connect to VR headsets and which will allow you then to like render the stereographic image on them. Since like with a lot of these graphic technologies, um, there is of course the API itself gives you like access to the hardware directly and gives you like um, the possibilities to talk to the devices, reading the sensors, but usually if you look from it from you want to create something, you tend to use a framework on top of it. So the same like you usually would use a game framework if you want to develop a game. And there it's pretty much the same. So I wanted to show more like also like because the minimum example for WebVR directly wouldn't have fitted on, on any slide. Um, there's currently like one very popular framework out there that's called A-Frame. Um, can found on the A-Frame IO, which is a component-based um, uh, web VR framework, where you're going and basically set up something like you say, okay, I have I have uh, a scene, I have um, then can place different like like boxes, spheres, cylinders, setting sky colors, and doing this all in this very HTML-ish style, where you just use elements and attributes on them, and can then animate them, and um, this is uh, one of the rather common ones. Another one currently is uh, 3JS, which has also been around like quite some time, but nowadays also bring web VR support, and it's also pretty good for this. Um, and so you go there basically, and then you go like, and can for example also like render a 360 degree image. And if you do this now on your mobile device, for example, um, and having like this, this Google Cardboard over there, you can just hit the, the Cardboard button. And what you will get is like um, on the mobile device, you will get like two eyes, can place this in the Cardboard and have like the, the full VR experience. Um, the support there is Edge already landed in version 15. In Chrome, it's for Android only from version uh, 56 on. In Mozilla, it's since version 39, but still behind the flag. And Safari has it under development. Unfortunately, with this VR headset stuff, there's usually the other problem with the hardware, and these hardware are not unique. So this matrix is a little bit more complex because like, not every browser can talk with like, uh, every headset there. So I recommend like, webvr.info, which has like, a more sophisticated list like you can use this headset if you're using Firefox with Servo on a Windows machine, but not anywhere else. And um, but so the large, I guess one of the large supported groups is like uh, maybe not for like professional VR headsets, but Google with a cardboard and Daydream devices work on any Android uh, device with a Chrome installed, like in the above version. So I guess that's like from from pure target audience, the largest group at the moment. And um, because these were quite esoteric APIs that most of us might never need, but good to know about them, I wanted to also like insert at least uh, one useful API in there, um, like useful for a lot of people, which is the Resize Observer API. So we have often the problem uh, as web designers and web developers that we kind of need to listen to sh changes in the size of an object. And until now, there's no like uh, native API for this. And Resize Observer will change this um, and works also again like 
as follows. You have like creating a new resize observer. You're giving it a callback as the first parameter. Um, the callback will get a list of entries where each entry is basically the, the size change event of one of the observed elements. You can iterate over them. There's a target, which is the DOM element again, and a content rect, which is like the new dimensions of this, uh, of this element. And then you can go there once you've created the observer and observe as many DOM elements as you want with it. And this will then cause the, the callback to trigger whenever some resize in the element occurs. Doesn't matter whether the browser resized, whether just the element resized due to changing layout, due to elements were moving on the page and whatsoever. And um, this is then, of course, like the, the native way. Um, so for example, this just basic layout with like uh, two, flex uh, two divs uh, in the flexbox beside each other and that are randomly changing their size. And as you can see there, these values are like rendered um, uh, via a resize observer there. And it's like there's absolutely no delay. Also, if you look uh, in the performance tool, this is like really fast native API now to get this uh, to get this done. Um, yeah, and basically looks like this, resize observer. We iterate over everything and just set the events for the element and then we can like connect multiple elements towards it. The resize observer API is in Edge under consideration. In Chrome, it will be released in with version 64, so the um, current uh, Canary build. In Firefox, it's under development, kind of. Um, so it was under development, and the latest entry in the comment in the ticket is, yeah, the developer doesn't have time for it anymore. Could anyone pick this up? So we will see uh, how this will go. And Safari has nothing so far. Um, but also, like, very good for this API is it, uh, you can polyfill it very well. So basically, there is one common polyfill also out there that is also, like, performance-wise pretty good, So which I can just recommend, like, if you need something um, to listen on changing element size, use the proper upcoming API, use the polyfill, which will fall back to the native API if available, and you are, like, better than just trying to build up your own uh, resize observing events. Um, in the last part, uh, because I, I figured out that, that, I've, uh, that it might be very useful for, for several people, is um, so-called origin trials. Who have heard about origin trials? Okay, yeah. Who's awake? Uh, okay, yeah, at least 20%. That's, that's rather good for that time. Okay, um, the, if there is an upcoming specification like Web Bluetooth, like Web USB, um, it's usually built in the browser, but first behind a flex, so you have to go to about flex, enable it, and then you can test around in development. The problem is you have no, like you can test this in development, but you usually have no real way to test it with a broader audience because, um, I mean, you cannot ask like all the visitors of your page to go to about flag, enable like that specific API just to test out web Bluetooth for you. Which again leads for the spec creators to them, them not getting like the proper feedback from us web developers because we cannot test it out with like a broader audience where we would get proper feedback and know how it behaves. And Rich and Trials actually tries to solve this for Chrome. Um, there are always a few APIs in origin trial, and what you can do is you can register a form online um, where you state your domain, and what you will get is from Google like uh, just a token, and you put this token inside a meta tag in your domain and in your into your web page. And now, like for that API that you've requested the token for, so for example, web USB that time, um, if now any visitor uh, comes with a Chrome on your page that have this API, but still behind a flag, Chrome will enable that API just for your web page for this user. So making it possible for you to also like test out features that are behind a flag still, like with a broader audience. Um, the problem with this is, of course, like APIs might change. And if you now build something uh, like production ready on it, you have the issue again, like what if the API change? And that's why the origin trials are directly limited in time so that you cannot really 
build anything without a fallback for production. So um, at the moment, for example, it's WebVR in there with like a newer API that it support currently, and it works from Chrome 62 onwards, and it will um, run out on February 27th, 2018, meaning after this, Chrome won't enable this API for you anymore, but until then, you can test it out, give feedback, and hopefully help um, to create the API or improve the API that before it's becoming stable. Um, two other APIs that are currently there is uh, generic sensors API, which is like a more generic approach to talk to the sensors of uh, your device, like motion, rotation, whatsoever. And media capabilities, which is like an API to send like a server details or uh, about what your device is capable of encoding or like how many uh, audio channels have your device connected and um, yeah, what just like what bit rate is uh, can the devi uh, device still encode so that a server could like determine the perfect audio encoding and for your specific device and give you like an optimized stream for your device there. Uh, that's from my side. Um, Web APIs for 2018, maybe 19, we will see. Um, and maybe not Safari. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them now. Also, you can reach me on Twitter or via mail. Um, I have a, a web page also where I blog sometimes. Um, the QR code is for the slides, actually, if you want uh, to look into any of these. Um, the slides also have the demo links, which are also on GitHub available if you want to look into more source code. And I want to say thanks to coming here. Thanks for coming to the conference. I hope you learned something new. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. <laughs>